Well, good morning to you. I'm going to begin with a little story. It's a story which begins like this. There was once a town high in the Alps that straddled the banks of a beautiful stream. The stream was fed by springs that were old as the earth and as deep as the sea. The water was clear like crystal. Children laughed and played beside it. Swans and geese swam in it. You could see the rocks and the sand and the rainbow trout that swarmed at the bottom of the stream. High in the hills, far beyond anyone's sight, lived an old man who served as keeper of the springs. He had been hired so long ago that no one could remember a time when he wasn't there. He would travel from one spring to another in the hills, removing branches or fallen leaves or debris that might pollute the water. But his work was unseen. One year, the town council decided they had better things to do with their money. No one supervised the old man anyway. They had roads to repair, taxes to collect, and services to offer. And giving money to an unseen stream cleaner had become a luxury they could no longer afford. So the old man left his post. High in the mountains, the streams went untended. Twigs and broken branches, and worse, muddied the liquid flow. Mud and silt compacted the creek bed. Farm waste turned parts of the stream into stagnant bogs. For a time, no one in the village noticed. But after a while, the water was not the same. It began to look brackish. The swans flew away to live elsewhere. The water no longer had a crisp sense that drew children to play by it. Some people in the town began to grow ill. All noticed the loss of sparkling beauty that used to flow between the banks of the streams that fed the town. The life of the village depended on the stream, and the life of the stream depended on the keeper. The city council reconvened. The money was found. The old man was rehired. And yet... Another time, the springs were cleaned. After yet another time, the springs were cleaned. The stream was pure and children played again on its banks. Illness was replaced by health. The swans came home. The village came back to life. The life of the village depended on the health of the stream. The stream is your soul. And you are the keeper. The stream is your soul and you are the keeper. Our soul, our life with God, like that stream of water, gives strength and direction and harmony to every other area of life. And when that stream is flowing well, we're constantly refreshed and exuberant and in all we do. Why? Because we are rooted in the vastness of God and his kingdom including nature, and all else within us is enlivened and directed by that stream. So here's my question for you this morning. How is your stream? How is your soul? Now, most of us might say, well, could be better. Might be in need of a bit of an overhaul. I have maybe drifted a bit or Other things have crowded out God in my life. Or I just recognize I'm anxious, harried, and stressed. So like a car needs a service, our bodies need a holiday. We all need renewal and refreshment. And you know, that really is at the heart and the purpose of Lent. It's that time to take stock and to reflect and to pause. To invite God to inspect the recesses of our hearts and our soul and our minds and our bodies. To allow God's renewing power and presence to bring that life afresh. So this Lent, as Anne has been talking about earlier, we're going to invite you on this road to renewal. And on this road to renewal, we're going to have this adventure which is really following after the life of Jesus, which leads to the cross and to the empty tomb, the events of Easter. So this event 
this Lent, let me invite you on this journey, this road to renewal. Renewal and refreshment is God's promise for all those who walk this journey. And we will learn over these weeks about the road of prayer, about holiness, about perseverance, as well as the cost of the journey. And it's a journey that we read that Jesus was on on this earth, and he invites us to follow him. In fact, it's a journey that every follower of Jesus needs to take. So today I've entitled Beginning the Journey, Beginning the Journey on this road to renewal. So let's just pause for a moment and pray as we open up God's word in Mark's Gospel, chapter 1. Lord God, you welcome us as we come this morning. I have this picture this morning of a funnel. And we all come, as it were, through the doors to the funnel with different feelings and emotions and experiences and maybe pain in our lives. But the funnel through worship and confession and through communion is to come to encounter Jesus. And I pray that as we open your word that we will encounter you afresh today by your power and by your spirit. Amen. So we see in Jesus, he receives and experiences the renewing power and presence of God. And we see this particularly on three diff- in three different ways of Jesus' journey. We see it on his journey of through the ty- trials and the tests and the temptations that Jesus faces, often on a daily basis. Secondly, we see it in the sudden outpouring of power as the kingdom of God advances. And then thirdly, we see in Jesus' life, it's strengthened by prayer and solitude and silence and fasting. And if we want the power and the presence of God through this renewal, we must practice these three areas in our own life. So I'm going to run through what those three areas might look like within the landscape of your life and my life. So that God's presence, like an underground river or stream, begins to grow and blossom and flow through us and in us. To reveal the underlying presence of God, which is always there, but sometimes gets blocked and choked. So God uses, I believe, three methods of exposure to his presence. And the first I want to talk about is erosion. Erosion. Now, as we look in Mark's gospel, if you've got a Bible or a phone, do turn there with me. We're going to go through this chapter of Mark. Uh, And Mark, I love Mark because he goes straight in and he tells us one thing to the next to the next. And at the beginning, we have Jesus being filled with the Spirit. And he's then thrust straight into the desert and the tempting by the devil. Verse 12 and 13 says that at once, the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and angels attended to him. Jesus knew what it was to be tempted, to be stretched and face difficulties on a daily basis when he walked this earth. And part of the journey as a follower of Jesus is walking on that journey. We are not immune from pain and suffering and trials and difficulties. And indeed, the Apostle James, later on in the New Testament, goes even further. He says this. How many of you got this stuck on your fridge? Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Here's what James is saying, that on the road to renewal, you will face trials of many kinds as God's presence is being revealed in your life. A number of years ago, a few of us went to uh, a leadership conference run by HDB. I said went to, I think it was online, this particular conference. And as part of the conference, uh, Nikki and Pippa Gumbel were interviewing uh, a couple called um, Rick and Kay Warren, who again were church leaders. But the particular thing about this interview was the way that Kay responded to all that she'd been through in her life, the trials, and particularly mentioned three things. One was the loss of their son, Matthew, eight years previously through suicide. Then secondly, she talked of the cancer that she'd been battling with. 
And then thirdly, of the sexual abuse she'd experienced as a child. And having been through all of those things, Nikki Gumbel was asking her the question, how do you keep trusting God through all these trials? And I'm going to show you a little clip from that interview. It's just three minutes. The sound quality isn't brilliant, so do bear with it. So let's just watch these, this little interview. What, what difference has your faith made for you, Kay, going through all of this? I'm going through all that. You've been through cancer, the trauma of Matthew. Um, what difference has your faith made for you? I feel like I'm a person of hope in a new kind of way. Um, I, um, I have next to where I, I have a time every day where I just um, meditate and quiet, um, pray. And I have um, what I call my hope box. And it's full of verses that give me hope. And I look at them often in the middle of the night because that's when I can't remember where they are. You know, middle of the night, I can't think of anything, but in my hope box, they're written out on cards and, and they're verses that, that give me hope and a, and a future. And I have right next to it, what I, it's a little ceramic pot and in it are all the questions I have about my life, about Matthew's death, about evil in the world, all the things that I don't know how to answer. And they're in my mystery pot because I know that I will probably not find all those answers here on earth. But for me to build a faith that is genuine and real, it includes both hope and mystery. Um, and I think every person who's going to have a robust, uh, vibrant faith in God has to learn how to live with both hope and mystery. Um, hope that has never been tested, has never gone through cancer, has never gone through loss, <clears throat> has never gone through pain and suffering. It's just untested optimism. It's not very reliable. It's, it can be easily shaken. But, but faith that has been tested then turns into hope. And mystery, um, mystery without hope will leave you bitter. And, but a combination of mystery, I, I trust in a good God who will answer my question someday. Those two together, hope and mystery, have, have given me the ability to face whatever has come my way, um, to know that I, my faith is more solid than ever. The spiritual roots of my life have gone down deep into the goodness of God. And when cancer tried to yank out the tree of my faith, when suicide tried to you know, yank out the tree of my faith, the roots held, but they held because I've spent my life sending them into the belief that God is good, even when I don't understand him, even when mystery remains. And so when I think of people who are in this period of time, we're alive in this period of COVID-19, God could have had us live at any other point in history, in the past or the future, but this is the moment where God has us. Mm -hmm. And so in this moment of COVID-19, God must want for us to develop the kind of faith that can survive mystery, that can live with mystery mm -hmm. and still be absolutely certain of the hope in a good God who is with us, watching us, leading us to a future where all those mysteries and all those sad things become untrue. So in spite of, or maybe because of, or in the middle of all of these things, as I choose to believe that's who God is mm -hmm. and put my roots deeper into him, I believe I have become more a person of hope mm -hmm. than ever. I would have been without those tests and those painful, painful suffering. And so persevering through the tough times of life. She said, I believe in a good God, despite whatever I face that comes my way, because my roots go deep. So on this road of life, this journey to renewal, how do you respond to the trials and the tests that come your way? The erosion that reveals God's presence. What is your response as a follower of Jesus? Is your response to the trials that you face different to those who don't know God? And if someone who is maybe not yet a Christian asks you, does your faith actually work in times of trouble? What would you say? So God uses erosion through the forces of life to reveal his presence within us. And as we go through that, we quickly realize 
that we cannot do this on our own. We cannot do this on our own. And the next way that God reveals his presence, I've called eruption. Eruption. In Mark 1, we see the eruption of the power of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus begins to walk this earth, he declares the kingdom of God has come and there's signs and there's wonders and there's healing and there's lives changed. We read this in verse 10 of Mark 1. Just as Jesus was coming out of, up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And then in verse 12, at once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness. And then through that chapter, we see signs and wonders of the kingdom coming and invading this world. And Jesus with power drives out the demonic. The clash of kingdoms of Jesus brings healing. And in verse 32, Mark sums it up this way. He says, that evening as after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon possessed. The whole town gathered at the door and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. As Jesus relied on the power of the Holy Spirit, so we would recognize how much more we need the regular, ongoing power and eruption of the Holy Spirit in our lives, a renewing work of God. So what is this word? We've talked about the road to renewal. What does this word renewal actually mean through Scripture and through our understanding? Well, in this book, Reappearing Church, by Mark Sayers, which we're encouraging people to read and one small group are studying as they go through, there's a definition which uh, Mark Sayers gives us for renewal. And he says it's this, and I think this is quite helpful. He says, it's the refreshment, release, and advancement that individuals, groups, churches, and cultures experience when they are realigned with God's presence. The sovereign outpouring of God's power and presence is a regular feature of Scripture throughout history. And we see it keeps popping up and erupting in the most unlikely places. I don't know if any of you have seen in the news or through social media uh, what's been happening at Asbury College in Wilmore, Kentucky in the States. If you haven't heard, in, um, on February the 8th, after an ordinary chapel service at this college, some students felt called to stay and to wait and to pray and to worship. And there was a, a real sense, a tangible sense of God's presence as they did this. And they talked about a deep sense of joy and of love and peace and a call to repentance that they'd not felt before. And more students began to join them. And as word got out on social media, people began to fly in and queue to go into this place to encounter something of God's presence. And then people began to take this flame to other colleges and other places around the states. Now it's very early days and we look to see what it is that God might do through this. But whenever we look in history, we see through renewal movements... The Spirit of God popping up in the most unlikely places and through the most unlikely people. In 1949, one of the greatest revivals in the history of the United Kingdom took place in the Hebrides. Seven men and two women had decided they would pray earnestly for revival. One night at a prayer meeting in a barn, a young man took his Bible and he read from Psalm 24. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. And this man shut his Bible and he said, It seems to me just so much sentimental humbug to be praying as we are praying. To be waiting as we are waiting here. If we ourselves are not rightly related to God. And he asked God, to reveal if his own hands were clean and if his heart was pure. And that night, God met them in a powerful way. As they waited on God, his awesome presence, as they wrote, filled that barn. See, revival is always, always connected with holiness. Where God reveals our hearts and the desire to be realigned with the presence of God. 
just four miles away from this barn where they were meeting, there were two elderly sisters. I love this story. One was aged 82, one was 84. They had a vision of God. They saw the churches crowded and the youth and the community flocking into the churches. They had a glorious assurance that God was coming in revival power. And such was the sense of God's presence throughout this island. One businessman says as he arrived in a ferry and got onto, stepped onto the land, he said, the moment I stepped ashore, I was suddenly conscious of the presence of God. God was meeting with his people. So as we enter this road to renewal over these coming weeks, my prayer would be, Lord Jesus, would you do it afresh here? Would there be an eruption? And as the song goes, Lord, would you start with me? With individuals and then as churches. We pray churches across this town and this nation and the communities to be set on fire with the revival power of God as renewal erupts amongst us. And you know, I, I've nearly always seen that one of the principal places this starts is through worship. Hence on Friday, hosting three hours of worship in this room was a wonderful place to encounter and seek after God. The Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. So I would encourage you, get hold of that song list we've put out on Spotify or uh, YouTube, wherever you listen to some music. And for yourself, just worship uh, in the normal part of your day when you're driving or wherever. And then as we gather together, there's an expectancy and a hunger as we seek to encounter the living God. And your expectancy, how you come, will define how much of God's presence you, we have as we draw together. So we have that sense of longing for that eruption. But the third way that I believe God meets us is through excavation. So yes, at first God, we see through erosion, testing and trials. He's forming and shaping us into maturity as our roots go deep and as we persevere. And that through eruption, the spirit of God is poured out, sometimes in exuberant and bubbly ways. But from my experience, these times are more occasional and irregular outpourings. So if that's the case, how do we, on a regular, ongoing basis, experience the presence of God in our lives? How do we nurture that deep, lasting life as a disciple of Jesus on that road to renewal? Well, in Jesus' life, we see a wonderful pattern here in Mark 1. We see this rhythm. We see Jesus full of the Holy Spirit. He's tempted. And in verse 33 of Mark 1, this is what we read. The whole town gathered at the door. Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. And then in verse 35, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Jesus needed solitude, time away from people to pray and be with his father. Do you know, it's only in recent years that the evangelical wing of the church, of which we would be a part, have really rediscovered this sense of the contemporary nature of going after the Christian disciplines. We've been help through wonderful writers like Richard Foster and Dallas Willard and Eugene Peterson. And Richard Foster puts it like this. He says that down through the centuries of Christian faith and practice, we are told that our side of the pursuit of God is discovered in the classic disciplines of the spiritual faith. The means of grace they've sometimes been called. Things like prayer and solitude and simplicity and service. These activities of body, mind, and spirit are the means God uses for bringing us into growing conformity to Jesus Christ. They are how we follow him in continuing discipleship, what we would call the path or the road of disciplined grace. Now, I have to be honest. I would tend to 
go towards the eruption part of those three rather than either the first one or the last one. I want to see the bubbling up of the Holy Spirit. I want to see the charismatic encounter, the Spirit of God at work in our lives. And I try to avoid the erosion of the trials of life. What I want is the Spirit of God and revival, signs and wonders, and the next outpouring. And in one sense, it's great to hunger for that, and we want more of that. But unless you understand the work of God in the erosion part of life, and the part we play in the discipleship of excavation, you will lack roots and depth and maturity, and it will be froth and bubble with no substance to it. Pete Gregg, in a great book called Dirty Glory, tells this story of the East African revival. In the East African revival, many, many people came to faith and a real sense of God's spirit being poured out in that part of the world. And often this was in the rural areas of Africa. Many people would set aside time to pray. And often in their small homes, they'd set off to pray in a nearby tree as they walked through near where they lived. And as they walked to pray each day, they wore a path through to the place of prayer. And as they met with others, they would ask each other this wonderful question. Is there grass on your path? Is there grass on your path? Are you regular in your prayer life? Wouldn't it be good over coffee if we asked one another, is there grass on your path? Is there grass on your path? So on this road to renewal, you will experience, we pray, God's renewing presence. As through the erosion of life, you recognize through trials and difficulties, God's presence can come through. We hope and pray we'll experience the presence of God through the eruption of the Holy Spirit as we encounter him, particularly in worship. But also through the excavation of the disciplines of going deeper through prayer and of solitude and of fasting. So let me just finish with this, quoting the wonderful uh, evangelist Billy Graham, who said this. He said, everywhere I go, I find that God's people lack something. They are hungry for something. Their Christian experience is not all that they had expected. And they often have recurring defeat in their lives. Christians today are hungry for spiritual fulfillment. The most desperate need of the nation today is that men and women who profess Jesus be filled with the Holy Spirit. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. So here's my question to you. Are you hungry? For more of the Holy Spirit? Do you feel as if maybe you lack something, as Billy Graham said? Is maybe your Christian experience not all that you expected it would be? So let's step into this road to renewal to begin today to unblock those streams and say, Come, Holy Spirit, we long for you. Would you stand with me? And if I can invite the band as well just to make their way up. We're going to end slightly differently today in the sense that we're not just going to sing a song together, but I'm going to invite you to respond to maybe what God has been saying to you by firstly just being quiet and inviting the presence of God, come Holy Spirit. But then with our bodies and a response, I'm going to invite you, if you would like to, just to come to the front. We're not going to have a prayer ministry pray for you, but just a chance for you to stand before God. And whether you stand or kneel or just ask God to fill you afresh, to mark this beginning of Lent, that you are hungry for more of him. And maybe you've not done this before, come to the front, but maybe it's the first time that you might encounter God afresh.